Welcome everyone to the Make Every Vote Count 2015 campaign webinar. My name is Anita Nickerson. I'm the Action Coordinator with Fair Vote Canada. We're also joined tonight by our Executive Director, Kelly Carmichael, Professor Dennis Pilon, the author of many books on reforming Canada's electoral system, including The Politics of Voting, MP Bruce Heyer, who is the Green Party's Democratic Reform Critic, MP Scott Sims, who is the Liberal Party Democratic Reform Critic, MP Craig Scott, who is the NDP Democratic Reform Critic. We're going to start tonight by with about a 15-minute presentation by Fair Vote Canada. Following that, we'll give each MP about 10 minutes to talk about their position on proportional representation and the position of their party as we head into the 2015 federal election. After that, the last half of the webinar will be devoted to your questions and answers with the MPs and the experts. So while I'm talking, you can be typing your questions into the question box on your control panel and we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. Let's start with what is Fair Vote Canada. We are a national, multi-partisan, grassroots citizens campaign for proportional representation. We support PR at all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, meaning that no matter where you vote in Canada, at what level, we believe your vote should count. We have over 30 local teams and 45,000 signers on our Declaration of Voters' Rights. For those of you who are new to this issue, what is proportional representation? Proportional representation isn't one particular system, it's a principle. It's a principle used by 85% of OECD countries. It basically says that your vote should count toward electing a representative that you want, and that results should be proportional to the popular vote. So if a party gets 30% of the vote, they should get roughly 30% of the seats. You can see here a few of the endorsers of our 2015 campaign. Um, in the center there, Idle No More, co-founder Sheila McLean. You can see David Suzuki, Hugh Siegel. Uh, we also have Dan Aykroyd, who's not on there. Many other notable Canadians and organizations that we're really glad to be working with, such as LeadNow.ca, Democracy Watch, Greenpeace, and the Council of Canadians. I'd like to start with something really important, which is what are we asking? This is what we're asking. To determine the best model of proportional representation, we call on the federal parties and their candidates to commit to, number one, conducting a consultation process, including citizen participation and multi-partisan experts immediately following the next federal election. Number two, implementing the model in time for the following election. So let's start with a few of the problems with winner-take-all voting. And when I say winner-take-all voting, it's helpful to remember that there's two major families of voting systems in the world, proportional voting systems and winner-take-all voting systems. So the problems that I'm talking about apply to all the systems in the winner-take-all group. First, let's remember that our voting system, first past the post, is about 800 years old. So we're talking about a system that was around when people thought that the world was flat. Most of the countries with first past the post didn't choose first past the post, they inherited it like Canada did. One of the main problems with winner-take-all systems are distorted results. And we can see here in the 2008 federal election that the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party got almost the same number of votes. However, Bloc voters were able to elect 49 MPs and Green voters elected nobody. And fast forwarding to the 2011 federal election, you can see that in Alberta, 66% of voters in Alberta voted for the Conservative Party. However, that 66% gave them 26 out of 27 of the seats. And heading east over to Quebec, we saw the NDP sweep Quebec, winning almost all the seats. And it wasn't because everybody in Quebec suddenly fell in love with the NDP. 43% of people in Quebec voted for the NDP, but first past the post handed them 78% of the seats. 
So we're seeing the same kind of thing as when the Bloc Québécois held almost every seat in Quebec. It's not that everybody in Quebec voted for the Bloc Québécois. It's that our voting system leaves us with representation that fails to reflect our diversity. So looking at the results in 2011, you can see on the left-hand side here, first past the post, and on the right-hand side, how things might have turned out with proportional representation. So let me qualify that first by saying that what you're seeing on the right-hand side isn't actually how things would have turned out with proportional representation. Because one thing we do know is with PR systems, more people come out to vote, and people vote differently. They're able to vote sincerely instead of strategically. But just looking at what we do know, how people voted with the system that we have, you can see that with First Past the Post, a single party was able to cross, cross that majority line of 155 seats, where 39% of the popular vote gave them 54% of the seats and 100% of the power. With a proportional system, none of the parties would have been able to win a majority of seats. Therefore, what would have most commonly happened would be either a minority government or actually much more common around the world a coalition government where two or three parties who have something in common would have worked together and governed together representing a genuine majority of voters. So how do we get a situation where a party with 39 percent of the vote gets 54 percent of the seats at 100 percent of the power? Well, basically it happens because every federal election, about 7 million of us cast votes that don't elect anybody. This is what we call wasted votes, votes that had absolutely no impact on the outcome of an election and elected no representation. And one of the misconceptions people often have is that proportional representation is about giving uh, more seats to small parties like the Greens. Sometimes it does that. It, it allows smaller parties to be better represented in Parliament, but that's really not what the main point is. You can see here in this chart that most of the people casting wasted votes in the last federal election and in every federal election aren't voters for small parties, they're voters for the larger parties. And in fact, if you look at the 2011 election, about 80% of Liberal voters elected nobody. This is a typical riding across Canada, and this is Kitchener-Waterloo in 2008. And here you can see that 36% of voters were able to elect a representative of their choice, and almost 64% of voters elected nobody. The other kind of riding we have in Canada is a safe riding, uh, where people will write to me and tell me the party who holds the seat in my riding could run a lamppost, and the lamppost would win. Either way, there are a lot of voters who are going without effective representation. So this is really about equality. Fair, uh, proportional representation is about a few fundamental principles, equality, fairness, inclusiveness. So we look at equality, are all voters in Canada equal? And we can see by these numbers that no, they're not. It took a lot more votes to elect a single Green MP, a single Liberal MP, a single Bloc MP than it did to elect a Conservative MP. So whether your vote counts in Canada really depends on who you vote for and where you live. And we can contrast that to New Zealand. What you're looking at here is an advertisement from a bus stop in New Zealand from their federal election which took place in September. And this advertisement is encouraging people to get out and vote. And it says, your vote is worth exactly the same as mine, and that's a powerful thing. We can't yet say that in Canada. What we can see, though, are the efforts of major polling companies like this one, who are running ads uh, with products. For instance, they say political parties aren't focused on every voter in every riding, only those that matter the most, and you should be too which just reflects the reality that our elections are really about a few swing voters and a few swing ridings. And there was actually a study done showing in the United Kingdom, uh, where we inherited first past the post, showing that parties spend up to 22 times the amount of money targeting voters in the swing ridings as they do targeting voters in the safe ridings. 
So taking another look at majority governments, uh, the current 39% majority government we have is actually the norm in Canada. And you can see that the last time we had a majority government that was actually supported by more than 50% of Canadians was in 1984. So to sum up a few of the problems with winner-take-all voting systems, distorted results, regional polarization, making it look like everybody in one area of the country supports one party and everybody in another area supports another, another uh, party, wasted votes, safe seats, uh, negative strategic voting, voting for somebody that you don't like to try to stop somebody you can't stand, campaigns that are aimed at a few swing votes and a few swing ridings, adversarial politics, uh, a situation where two parties who maybe have the most in common are actually the most bitter enemies because every riding is a zero-sum game where it's one winner take all. Low voter turnout, suppression of minority views, and a barrier to electing more women and minorities. So if we can agree with many of these problems with first past the post voting, we can look at why proportional representation. Let's look at the evidence for making votes count. A lot of the research on this has been done by a man named Aaron Leiphart, and he actually spent his entire career studying this very issue. What's the difference between what he calls consensual democracies those with proportional representation, and majoritarian democracies, what we call winner-take-all voting systems. And he issued two editions of his book, each covering 36 countries over 25 years. And he found that voter turnout was 7.5% higher in countries with proportional systems. Government policies were closer to the view of the median voter. Citizens were more satisfied with their democracy and 8% more women were elected. His research has been replicated uh, by many different people, and one of the core findings that's been replicated is that proportional systems create governments which better reflect the views of the median voter. Which doesn't really sound very exciting until you think about the implications for policy. So if we look at a few issues that where there's been um, a body of strong correlational research, we can see that on the environment, countries with proportional systems score six points higher on the Yale Environmental Index. Countries with proportional systems have lower in income inequality, whereas countries with majoritarian systems have higher income inequality. And actually, the researchers found that the more proportional the system, the lower the income inequality, and the majoritarian systems had the opposite effect. And finally, the economy. I mean, this is something that doesn't get talked about a lot, but uh, there was a study out of the London School of Economics that actually found that countries with moderately proportional systems had more surpluses and fewer deficits, so definitely fiscal responsibility. And they, there was also a study looking at countries over a period of 200 years that found that countries using proportional systems had higher levels of economic growth. So basically, when it says policies are closer to the view of the median voter with PR, PR is really policy neutral. What it's saying is that whatever voters want with PR, when our votes count, we get more of it. And here we can see how proportional representation affects the number of a women, and, and women is a proxy also for minorities. But we're going to talk mainly about women here about it affects how many women are able to be elected. And here we can see that the four countries using winner-take-all voting, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and USA, are down at the bottom of the barrel, electing uh, about 20-25% women, whereas countries with proportional systems elect significantly more women. And the United Nations says that in order for women's voices really to make a difference in a parliament, they need to cross that 30% threshold. Our voting system has a lot to do with why women in Canada have really hit a glass ceiling, usually hovering around the low 20s in terms of how many 
are elected to Parliament, because in our system, each party can only put forth one candidate in each single member riding, and that pre uh, presents a real barrier to women being nominated and elected. Proportional representation and stability. This is really important because sometimes there's a misconception out there that it's some kind of a trade-off. If we make votes count and we have proportional representation, that means uh, that our governments will somehow be less stable. And actually there is no trade-off. Dennis Pilon, who's with us tonight, did a study over 50 years and found that countries using first past the post and countries using proportional systems actually had almost exactly the same number of elections. And that may seem counterintuitive. It may be, you may be more likely to think, well, if there are minority and coalition governments, aren't there more likely to be early elections? And actually no, because proportional representation changes the system of incentives. When nobody can uh, go after their own gold ring of the 39% majority, suddenly there's no incentive to call an early election, but there is an incentive to cooperate and work together. We've had 13 years of public opinion polls by many of the major polling companies in Canada that show a strong majority of Canadians, voters for all parties, support proportional representation, 70% in the last poll of 2013. We've also had 10 assemblies and commissions in Canada now that have recommended PR, uh, nine in the provinces and one federally, which was the Law Commission of Canada in 2004 which did uh, 16 public consultations and a two-year study, and their report is on our website. Basically, whenever you bring experts, citizens together, they come to the same conclusion, that we need a more proportional voting system. So I'm going to wrap up here with what I started with, which is what our campaign ask is. We'd like a new commission right after the 2015 election and we want the results of that commission to implement the more proportional model in time for the 2019 federal election. All right, well I'd like to invite the other panelists, our three MPs, Kelly and Dennis, to turn on the webcams. Yay. One, two, three, four. Okay, and so on the line with us tonight, we also have um, Scott Sims, but we couldn't get his webcam to work. I'm just rearranging things on my screen so that I can see everybody here. Okay, so I'm going, but Scott Sims is on the line with us. So again, we have MP Bruce Tyre. We have Executive Director Kelly Carmichael, we have Professor Dennis Pilon, we have MP Craig Scott, and on the telephone with us we have uh, the Liberal Democratic Reform critic Scott Sims. So a few people did uh, write me in questions, so I thought I'll just start with those. Okay, so this person says, I am concerned about the declining interest of citizens in our country's government and formulation of public policy as demonstrated by declining voter participation. How will proportional representation help in this regard? What good arguments are there to offset the perceived feeling that PR in a five-party race will inevitably lead to minority or coalition governments? Who would like to start? You decide, Anita. All right, Bruce, you're on. Well, Anita, you've already done a great job of explaining, answering that question. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought I was going to get to do a short uh, summary of some opinions before we ask questions. So can I just go ahead and do that? Yes, please do that. Thank you. Okay. okay well, yes. your, your PowerPoint is fantastic, and I hope it's available to anybody who wants it. I want a copy. It's very clear. It's very good. You've done a great job of explaining it, so thank you. One of your first slides said that uh, Fair Vote Canada is multipartisan. I think that's part of your problem. Uh, I think uh, Fair Vote Canada has taken the gloves off. Uh, you've all been too nice, too long. It's a common Canadian problem, especially on the left and centre. And um, 
I think uh, if parties don't come on board, uh, then uh, turf them. Uh, just uh, criticize them and uh, say, uh, be honest and say the only parties that really endorse uh, uh, proportional representation are X, X and Y and, and Z and A just don't do it yet. And uh, so please don't vote for them. So there's a little editorial comment. Um, <clears throat> I frequently talk about this, and I have a very uh, simple elevator speech because a lot of people are confused by this issue, and for some reason my little ele elevator speech seems to work for them. And I say, when I talk about proportional representation, I mean if the Purple Party, you know the Purple Party, if the Purple Party gets 20% uh, of the national vote, the Purple Party gets 20% of the seats. And then I say, it can seem a little complicated deciding which system you use to do that. And it can be a, sound a little complicated. And to be honest, I'm still not sure which uh, exact method I prefer. But as soon as you explain it in those simple terms, and you say that most systems allow you to direct, directly elect most of your uh, members of parliament, and then there are a variety of ways of topping it up and making it proportional. They go, aha, that doesn't sound that complicated. So my next opinion is if we try to go directly to any one sort of proportional system, whether it's in a province or federally, it will fail. It failed in BC, it failed in Ontario. And part of the reason is that when you go to one particular type, some people are confused by it. But those who basically want proportional but don't like that particular method uh, may not vote for it. So I really believe we need a two-stage process where through a referendum or some similar system, we ask Canadians directly or indirectly, do you want some kind of proportional representation where we do away with our winner-take-all system used in only a few percent of the world, only five countries that I'm aware of use first past the post, and I believe they are Britain, USA, Canada, India, and that bastion of democracy, Zimbabwe. So do we want to get rid of that and go to where most of the democracies in the world have gone in some kind of proportionality? Uh, as your poll showed, I think if we ask a clear, lucid question, the answer will be yes. And then there could be a variety of ways in which we have a second step where we pick maybe the two or even three best possibilities and then get people to choose between those. The other thing I say in my elevator speech is, for me personally, any form of proportional representation would be better than what we have now. Probably the worst form of proportional representation, whatever that is, would be better than what we have now. And we do away with what we have now, which is false majorities, where 39% of the, of the uh, popular vote can get you 120% of the power, have you noticed? I'd just like to talk quickly about, my, as I see, the four main parties. Um, the Conservatives, uh, Mr. Harper said repeatedly, when back when he was a minority, he said that he was in favor of proportional representation and would implement it given the opportunity. Of course, he said lots of things back then that he doesn't want to go for now. I don't see it happening. He likes his uh, absolute power. Um, in, the Liberals in Ontario, after promising they would uh, seriously consider proportional representation and put it out for a plebiscite, uh, set it up to fail, to be blunt about it. Uh, didn't fund it, made it confusing, and, and weren't really committed to it. And now they're talking about uh, preferential voting, and preferential voting, let's be clear, is not proportional. Uh, it's even debatable whether it's more democratic, but it's certainly not proportional. So they don't seem to want to go there. The NDP says they want to go there, but they had majority governments provincially in BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and didn't do it. So I hope they're really committed uh, here. Um, so the last thing I'd like to say, a very partisan comment, is I really believe the next uh, government is going to be a minority government. And um, I think the Greens are going to hold the balance of power. 
And if we hold the balance of power, it's going to be a condition in a minority government or a coalition government that we really get serious about proportionality. And if uh, the, the uh, other players don't want to go there, then we'll have another election quickly. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Uh, we'll go alphabetically. So, Craig? It's, it's Craig, very I, rare. I can you hear me? Hear you. No, you can't hear me. Now I can hear you. We can't hear all right, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, yeah, it's very rare that I'm I'm I come before somebody else in the alphabetical order, so I guess that uh, that that means Scott is third. Uh, I'll just say a few things. I think it's um, um, we can all deal with historical issues. Uh, I'm prepared to grant that it's been under liberal governments in the provinces that uh, some kind of process to try to change the system to PR has actually occurred. Two citizens' assemblies, in um, Ontario, one in Ontario and one in BC, and they went to a vote and they both failed. Uh, I'm also prepared to accept that NDP provincial governments haven't done much, nor has any NDP provincial government actually run on it as anything resembling a top platform item. And that's going to be very, very different for what the NDP is uh, already proposing and will be putting forward for this uh, upcoming election. Tom O'Kerr has made very clear <clears throat> that he wants to see this as the last unfair election. And the flip side of that is uh, a process to get us to a new system that we would, uh, we're would we putting forward, mixed member proportional system by 2019. Believe me, I wouldn't be doing this job as the Democratic reform critic if I weren't absolutely dedicated uh, to that outcome. And I wouldn't be Democratic reform critic if Tom Mulcair didn't firmly believe in this. So I think it's really important that everybody understands our leadership on this uh, is strong and it's real. Uh, the mixed member proportional system that uh, we favor is uh, would be a Canadian adaptation. It's important to say that whatever happens in Canada has to fit Canada. A Canadian adaptation of the system uh, used in Germany, New Zealand, uh, and Scotland, to give three examples I'd like to use. And effectively, you're given two votes, uh, viewing this from the voters' perspective. You go into the voting booth, and you have two ticks on one ballot. The first tick is, who do I want as my local member of parliament? The same as you currently do. Um, and let's just say we keep the current system for that. You don't have to, but you can. You just Whoever gets the most votes becomes the local MP. The second uh, vote, however, is for which party would you like to see with the strongest representation in parliament? The two votes don't have to be the same. You could vote for me, knowing I'm, a, I'm an NDP here, and say I like the way he's been an MP, da da da. So yes, Craig, and then go over and vote Green. And so the separation of votes is great because what that's going to produce is more and more people will look at the NDP vote, the M local MP vote, and say, I can vote across party lines. I can reward somebody who's actually doing something for the community, a good representative whose value system is my own, even though I don't necessarily identify with that party. And what you can do thereby is send parties to the uh, MPs to the House of Commons under that first tick, who are more likely to have stronger cross-party, sort of cross-societal support, and that will in turn make them more independent in the House of Commons. On the other side, along with that result, you have a House of Commons that reflects the uh, proportional vote that the, each party has received. So if you get roughly 30%, you're going to see roughly 30% of the seats for that party in the House of Commons. The mechanism whereby that happens uh, is not something we can go in, need to go into right now, but basically two votes produces a local MP who's directly accountable to you, and then it produces a House of Commons that's roughly proportional to the percentage of votes each party received. That's what we're fighting for, and one of the reasons that we're fighting for it is not that not that we somehow or other have figured out what's going to benefit the NDP. In fact, in the last election, if we had any PR system, we would have five or six fewer seats. Uh, in Quebec, we wouldn't have anywhere near the number of seats that we took in the so-called Orange Crush, as Anita pointed out. The fact is it's the right thing to do. Uh, there are so many problems with our current system that just as a matter of overriding democratic principle, we have to change the, the playing field. I also believe that uh, Canadians want to see an electoral system that isn't just fair in the sense of uh, representing parties, 
in, in a way directly proportional to the votes they've received, but that produces a more productive House of Commons. And one of the things about minority governments, except you know, in certain periods in our history, but often minority governments, are situations of forced uh, cooperation, forced compromise, where a lot more uh, consensual lawmaking occurs that in the end, uh, a lot of historians and analysts will go back and say those are the periods of the most productive changes in our history. What proportional representation will do is more or less structure that kind of situation where we will always now expect that no one party will on their own have a majority of the seats. It will completely change the dynamics in terms of parties knowing that they have to keep in mind a broader spectrum of opinion that is uh, housed in their own party. They have to work with other parties and in turn that's going to produce much more uh, of a role for each individual MP in a House of Commons where discussion, debate and, and moving towards um, a kind of a productive compromise is going to be much more the norm than it is now. Um, I kind of, I believe that our particular system, a mixed member proportional, adds to that dynamic for the reason that I gave earlier. I believe it's a system that will allow local MPs to no longer be a mere appendages of their parties. And the problem right now is that when an average, when a person goes into a um, voting booth, they are forced with one tick to say, which party do I want to see represented? Uh, who do I like as my local representative? And at some level, because of our the way political culture has evolved, some people are just going in and saying, well, who, which leader do I prefer? But let's just leave it at the level of the party and the individual MP. And often you'll have somebody saying, oh, I like that local candidate or the existing MP, don't like the party, or for one reason or another, I prefer another party, or vice versa, that uh, I really do not like that person, but I like the party. I, I prefer the value system of the party the person represents. At the moment, you're forced to choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. And if now you can say, I'm only going to elect somebody who deserves it on whatever matrix you think is you're, you're using for assessing whether a candidate deserves your vote, that person is going to go to the House of Commons with much greater support, sustained support, uh, cross-community support that will allow them to be much more of an independent-minded member of their own party. So let me leave that. Uh, that's all I would say because I think the, the presentation, to echo what Bruce said that Anita put on, uh, sets the scene well, I think, for anybody listening as to why our system just has to be replaced. We believe, uh, maybe somewhat different from Bruce, that we, we should not be reinventing the wheel. Uh, I, I'm open to Bruce's argument that strategically one should do it the way Bruce described. But we've had 10 commissions or citizens' assemblies across this country, all taking place in the 2000s. Every one of them said, get rid of this current system. And all but one said, mixed member proportional is the best system for Canada. And so at some level, if we want to get this done, we should build on the wisdom that's already come out of so many good attempts to change our system, rather than starting over again. And so I believe it, leave it there. Thank you, Craig. And Scott Sims, are you still with us? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, let me start by apologizing for doing this over the phone. I, uh, I am in the middle of a blizzard right now, and I couldn't make it to my office. And plus, the town next door to me is on flood alert, or we officially call it river watch. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little tense around here. But nonetheless, I'm glad to be here. And actually, I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this for several reasons. Um, the benefit of going last is you you have the chance to rebut others. But to be quite honest with you, I, I don't want to engage in that because I don't think it's a, a fair thing to do. Uh, we've had this debate before. We've had it in the House um, back and forth. Uh, Craig and I have talked about this, debated about this quite a bit. Um, there are a lot of similarities in position, but then there are a lot of dissimilar views too. And, and I'm willing to address that during the questions. Um, Many, many years ago, my first experience about, uh, about voting was I remember my grandmother and grandfather had this routine. My grandfather used to say, you know, I am, uh, I am a true conservative, he would say. I'm a progressive conservative. And he'd go down and he'd vote. And my grandmother would follow him, always saying, I'm going to go down and cancel your grandfather's vote. And I thought to myself, well, that's a strange way of exercising democracy. But 
in that exercise, I realized that you know not every system is perfect, and you know if if that's the case, then maybe my grandfather's vote should have counted for something more. Recently, we have had a debate within our party in a substantial way, and I want to thank each and everybody listening, watching at this point for all your your input. Um, I started this job ten years ago, and I'm going to be completely and I'm speaking from my own perspective, not from the parties, by saying that no, I worked my writing very hard, and I wanted to become the best local politician that this place has ever seen, and I strive to do that always. And I always feared that proportional representation stood up to that, was in the way of that. But in the last three years, I've been on a journey from, from all of you, most listening to this right now, about how proportional representation and an element of it can bring, bring us as a nation to the point where we can have the equal number of votes to mirror what is happening in the House of Commons. So in other words, the one argument that stuck to me was always, your vote will not be wasted. And I think that's a valid argument. When you get into the last couple of years, uh, let's take a look at our party itself. And we, we are open. We've decided several years ago that we would listen to the party and go by what the party would say at our biennial conventions. In 2012, we adopted the process of the um, preferential ballot alternate vote, if you wish. And we now instituted that throughout the party. We do it through our nominations. We endorse that, and, uh, and we're hoping to go forward with that. But in 2014, something changed with us in our party. And this is what we decided, and we had one of the largest biennials ever. We had quite a, quite a turnout. And what we passed uh, overwhelmingly at our biennial was this that immediately after the next election, an all-party process be instituted involving expert assistance and citizen participation to report to Parliament within 12 months with recommendations for electoral reforms, including, without limitation, a preferential ballot and or a form of proportional representation to represent Canadians more fairly and serve Canada better. This is, this is a big step for us from a party perspective. We have had commissions in the past internally and through government. Uh, Pierre Trudeau did it in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, as well as Quebec at that time. But what we want to do is we want to do this responsibly. I know others have said that we have had many commissions across this country. But I live in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we've never truly had this discussion, much like other provinces. So I respect other parties who say, let's go do this system specifically right now. But I truly believe that we have to do this responsibly so that we don't do any of the mistakes that were had during British Columbia Citizens Assembly or what would happen when MMP was presented to Southern Ontario. As a matter of fact, I'll even say this about MMP. It's one of the better systems of proportional representation if you're going to infuse that within our current system. And one of the best benefits, as Craig alluded to, one of the best aspects of that is one of the best selling items of MMP is to say, look, you have a ballot that you can actually vote for a candidate and a party, two separate ticks instead of one. And I agree with that. It's, it's actually a selling matter. But we need to bring this to the entire nation uh, as to way, how we can do this responsibly. And, you know, we've had recently we had the debate in the House of Commons that was brought forward by the NDP. But it was very specific in what it wanted to do. It wanted to introduce that one system that Craig spoke of, and the one that I just spoke of, glowingly. Half, over half of our caucus, it was it, before the vote took place in our caucus, Justin Trudeau said, look, we are going to take a profound step here. I want everybody in this room to exercise their free vote to tell their constituents how they feel about this issue. More than half of our, of our members voted in favor of it. Now, I didn't because I thought it was overly prescriptive. But I'm certainly willing to look at this, and I think that our party is too. And I've received a lot of input since then about other types of systems that could be engaged. I know I'm not in favor of a complete list, PR, but because of the, you lose that local aspect. If there's one thing that liberals do believe in, is the fact that direct representatives are a true function of our democracy. By way of example, I'm currently fighting the federal government on a wrecked ship just off the coast of Newfoundland that's spewing oil. It's a very local issue, but it's a federal responsibility. 
And, and quite frankly, if I don't speak up, who does? So the idea of uh, that true connection between citizens and their local representative has to be maintained. But we do also believe in the argument that no vote should be wasted. So I want to thank all those who, has, who have given us the input and advice as we move ahead. Um, as a matter of fact, we have a lot of common ground with Bruce and Craig uh, in our current discussions. And I think that in the future, Fair Vote Canada, as well as the other organizations, and I want to say thank you to Fair Vote BC as well, uh, who provided us with a lot of information. And going forward, um, the debate, we hope, will become that is be far more comprehensive than it ever has been with citizen engagement, but not just in specific areas, but all parts of the country, coast to coast to coast. Thank you, Anita, for, for allowing me to join you this evening. Thank you, Scott. All right, so now I will go to some of the questions from people. Um, okay, so this, this question kind of encompasses the bunch of different issues, but as I'm going through the questions, I'm seeing some different themes here, so I'm picking out the ones that are the most common, okay? Um, okay. I'm concerned about the declining interest in citizens in our country's governance, the formation of public policy, in part <coughs> defining voter participation. How will PR help in this regard? What good arguments are there to offset the perceived, any underlying perceived, negative feeling that PR will inevitably lead to minority or coalition governments. Um, maybe I'll just start at the top of my webcam with Bruce and kind of go through anybody that wants to speak to it. So Bruce? Well, there are two, two answers for me. The, the first is that I really like minority and coalition governments most of the time. Um, early on in my MP career, I traveled to Europe a lot. I saw their round, circular, um, non-confrontational minority governments where they um, treat each other with respect and uh, don't do the sort of silly, stupid things we do where we fear that uh, the loss of one single seat can mean the difference between zero power and 100% of the power. So I believe that when we get this, once in a while, we'll probably get a leader and, uh, and government, or party rather, that does attract 51% uh, or more of the electorate, more power to them. It means that, boy, they're dynamite. But most of the time, we need uh, cooperation and collaboration uh, between the parties. And, and so I don't take up too much time. Maybe I'll just leave it at that right now. Okay. Um, Dennis, did you have a comment on that? Can you remind me what the question was again? <laughs> They, the person basically wanted to know how do you deal with the perceived uh, negative or fear people have that proportional representation is going to lead to minority and coalition governments? Well, um, I mean, I, I think the best way to deal with concerns people have is to look at what has actually happened in countries that have used PR. Uh, because, yeah, the unknown, the mysterious, who knows what the future will hold, that can seem a bit scary. But when we look at countries that look a lot like Canada in many ways, we see that they have used proportional systems for 50, 80, 100 years, uh, and nothing terrible has happened to them. Uh, they've managed to uh, deal with the issues that they've faced, and in fact, in many ways, they've managed to deal with them more effectively, I think, than we have. Um, so as long as Canadians don't agree, about which party should have all the power. And that, in that sense, you know, I, just, I think we have to be Democrats, ultimately, and respect the wishes of the voters. If the voters aren't going to give a majority of their support to one party, then frankly, we should just deal with it. We should figure out a way to work together. I think our examples of minority government in this country in the past have been pretty good, with a, a few exceptions. And I think that the examples of minority and coalition government in um, uh, some of our European uh, 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 friend countries uh, have been very productive. So uh, I'm not afraid of what kind of results we would get. Okay. Craig? Uh, thanks, you Anita. I, I, I think it's important to... Okay, is it now kicking in? Yeah. Okay, sorry, there's a delay. Um, I think the first part of the question had to do with uh, participation and I think it's just it's very clear that uh, people will feel more invested in government and not um, and, and know that each of their votes 
will count towards how <clears throat> the House of Commons looks. And they'll also more likely come out to vote because they know that they'll be uh, casting a ballot for a local MP that will be part of a different uh, mindset. People will all be looking at the MP from a, 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 the perspective of is this person a warrant or meriting being elected as an MP and not simply uh, are they an appendage of a party. So I think that most social science research was just between four or five and even up to sometimes seven percent um, uh, of an increase in participation just in electing will be produced by bringing in PR especially if you've gone down to the levels of voting that we've received. So I think it's important that it's a start for increasing more robust participation which starts with voting but shouldn't end there. The second thing is I just would just endorse what Bruce and Dennis said. Um, it's really important not to be afraid of uh, minority slash coalition governments. Uh, that is where contrasting points of view have to grapple with each other and where you have a much better chance of the more persuasive argument ultimately prevailing than in a system where you simply give power to a certain narrower set of ideological beliefs that can simply impose its solutions, which ultimately and often can turn out to be wrong because they've not been tested. And so the idea of having different points of view always as part of your parliamentary process, except in the few situations Bruce alluded to where a party does maybe get 51%, is a, is an actual benefit. It will make our system that much more robust. It will make sure that the decisions that are made have been road tested and are more likely to stand the test of time. On climate change, for example, you want uh, parliament after parliament after parliament, the first set of decisions about how to seriously finally deal with climate change to stick and not be something that can just be pulled away in the next um, parliament. And you can give examples like that all over the place. Thank you, Craig. Uh, yeah. Scott? Yeah, um, when I was first elected in 04, I, I went straight into a minority on the government side. Following 2006, I was on the minority side and the opposition on the minority side. Um, when I, we first went in with Paul Martin's minority, I remember the talk around the nation was, wow, we have a minority government, you know, maybe we'll get uh, all the things wonderful about the minority government, you know, power sharing uh, on certain issues, some things will be done. As a matter of fact, you know, you can look at going back to the introduction of national health care as one of those uh, products from uh, coalition at the time, or sorry, but minority governments. But you know, since 2005, our minorities, our minority governments have been more about brinkmanship than they have been about collaboration. Uh, we went to, uh, last year I went to uh, England and I spoke to an individual there, he was a Liberal Democrat, and he, uh, he pointed out to me that, the, that they were having trouble with their coalition, but when it worked, was when times when they all found a common goal before they went out there and and pronounced to the you know to the country what what this policy would be but at the by the same token he said what made it work even more than that was that they were respective of each other's parties and principles but it's all that level of respect that i didn't see during the run up from 2006 up until uh, the last election 2011 and you know, I think over time, it's like one of those things where European countries who have working coalitions, they have this because they've been through it. So there's nothing new under the sun for them when it comes to coalitions. So they've learned, they've grown into a, a mature um, state of mind so that they're able to handle it. And by having the system that they have, maybe that has done that. Um, you know, you look at the exercise that we had where Stéphane Dion and uh, Jack Layden um, put forward a, a coalition where they would become the government and the cry around the country was, and certainly to me because I was a Liberal MP, they said, you know, how dare you um, put this coalition together and get your way to power by cheating? And you had to say to people, but it's not cheating. It's our system. It's the system as we elect MPs. So there is a huge, huge um, level of you know, distortion out there when it comes to our system. And unfortunately, if we don't have a discussion like this about PR introduced into our country, 
I fear that if we don't have that proper discussion, then there won't be any participation in that, and the whole thing will fail. And uh, and as for the the other the first part of this engagement, there's no doubt there will be a higher level of participation by the numbers that Craig put out there. I have no doubt. But uh, again, it makes the ballot look more attractive, and uh, hopefully that will be the case. Thank you. Dennis, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, just based on the contributions that people were making, that you know, one of the things we have to remember is that when you change the voting system, you change the incentives that politicians face. And so it's very hard sometimes for people to look at the behavior of our politicians in a minority government in Canada or the UK, which uses our first-past-the-post voting system, because often there's an incentive for the politicians to want to rush back to the electorate when they think that things are moving in their direction. You know, when they think that they'll get that bump that'll allow them to turn, you know, 40% of the votes into 60% of the seats. But of course, under a PR system, those incentives change. So it's not just culture. It's not just that, you know, Europeans are better at getting along. I mean, you know, they did have those two world wars after all. Um, but it's that they have a different incentive structure with a PR system. They know that calling another election probably won't change things very much, unlike the kind of casino results that we get under our first-past-the-post system. <laughs> Ellie, did you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I would just, I'm going to keep it very short, I would just say that it's more in our recent history that coalitions have become somewhat of a dirty word, and in my mind that just means working together. And I think yeah. that's what voters want. They want a more robust debate and having parties work together on their behalf. So I would say that it shouldn't be anything that should frighten people. It should be a welcome change. Sure. Okay. All right, this next question, um, I'm seeing it repeated on a lot of my question boards here. Basically, the question is, what's the plan? If I could kind of boil it down to that. Uh, so this fellow says, I've heard the NDP say they'll work toward proportional representation and the Greens have had it in their platform for a long time. Are the Liberals now saying they will add it and institute PR before the first mandate is over if they form the government? And the second part of the question is, the Liberals through their leader have previously stated they will not cooperate with other parties. That said, should the NDP form a minority government, will the Liberals reconsider and work with the NDP to create electoral reform and put PR in place before the end of the first mandate? So I guess that would be Scott and Craig. Scott first. Okay, so the, the sorry, the, the cut out there a bit. The first part of the question was about uh, before the next election. Is that correct? I think basically people are asking, what's under each different scenario, because we don't know what's going to happen under the 2015 election, right? We could, one party that's here tonight could have a majority, we could have a minority, who knows? Uh, what's the plan to hopefully get this implemented by the 2019 election, and are the Liberals committing to having a new voting system in place before 2019? Yeah, see that, and this was the conversation we had at the party levels I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't have a definitive answer, yes or no, but at this stage, but what we're doing now is we're working on language for the election of 2015. What to put out there? I mean, we we certainly got marching orders from the party itself by saying that we have to come together. That's why we put the uh, time limit of 12 months on it, so that we can have something far more definitive for 2019. Um, I understand, you know. The questions are, are such that, yes, you're right. Um, I mean, we'd all like to have our definitive plans put in place so that by 2019 we know what we're facing. But we also have to go through this process where we reach out to the whole country, and, and not just a few provinces, but the entire country to do this. And that way, by 2019, it would be far more definitive. I think, you know, as we go forward with this, I think that what's, what, what we need to have is that conversation that <coughs> This, this group is having right now, but pushed out towards the extremes and, and pushed out towards like where I am right now in Newfoundland and Labrador, where this conversation has never taken place. And I have to, sorry, the second part was about... Um, I think this, the second part was really basically, um, and I, you know, I'm going to rephrase this for all the parties. Are you willing to cooperate with each other to get this done? That's kind of what it boils down to. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I wholeheartedly agree. That's why I said earlier tonight, uh, in the case of what Craig and Bruce both had to say, there are a lot of common elements there. And I, I know the NDP, even, you know, they, they have their system, MMP. We're not saying that's a bad system at all. Um, we're saying that it's something that we want to be more responsible for. I mean, if I could quote, there's a quote here. It, it's not the type of thing that you can do either by just snapping your fingers the day after an election or without profound consultation, which we agree. I mean, you can't just shove it down people's throats. And it was Tom, it was Tom Mulcair that said that. So, you know, I agree with him. And, and hopefully we can, we can have that discussion. But for cooperation on this particular issue, absolutely. Okay. And Craig? Yeah, I think it's important for the question to distinguish between pre and post this next election. So let's go to the post first of all. Uh, our commitment is to uh, do everything we possibly can to have a proportional representation system in place for the next election. And we have tried to take seriously the history of Canadian engagement in, in, in five to six provinces, including the federal level. Uh, so I do understand Scott's points that not all provinces, but with BC, Ontario, Quebec, uh, federal level with the Law Commission of Canada effectively acting like the Royal Commission, we really do not want to invent the wheel. We want to be the party that's pushing for this to be a reality within four years. So the first year, the 12 months, um, that would be a citizen and an expert, uh, all, an all-party process with citizens and experts helping design what mixed member proportional would look like. That would be the the the, the kind of the buy-in education phase that Scott is uh, saying is needed. I do accept, of course, that means within the broad framework of accepting mixed member proportional, but we're prepared to go out there and say it is ultimately the only system that makes sense for Canada. And it's been protested with nine out of ten citizens' uh, uh, commissions or assemblies, citizens' assemblies over the last ten years, uh, twelve years. Uh, and then it would end up with a legislative time frame that basically gets us to the point where Elections Canada uh, has time to implement it before 2019. And I actually have a detailed uh, mapped out schedule for that, but it's the kind of thing that would make somebody's eyes glaze over if we actually put it out as, as part of the platform versus the, the more uh, condensed version. Um, before the election, look, this is one part, uh, by the way, after the election coalition slash uh, mutual support in a minority government situation, we're already on record as, as saying we would do that after the next election. If, if, no, if no party gets more than a, a majority and we're left with the uh, NDP Greens and Liberals with the seats, we will cooperate. The whole point is, uh, is to make sure that we change the system, but also, frankly, nobody wants uh, this particular government to have another shot at, the, uh, at, at governance if, in fact, this time around, uh, they don't get a majority. That's just a sidebar. Before the election, um, I actually have, I'm on record in a fairly long McLean's article saying what I was doing in the House with my motion that Scott described where half the Liberal caucus moved uh, and voted with the NDP on our proposal for mixed member proportional to be in place by 2019 effectively was it was an offer to say on this one important issue that's just at the very foundations of our democracy, if we can go into the next election with at least three parties and then independents who uh, obviously have been playing a role too, Greens, NDP and Liberals all committed to PR. Even if the Liberals came in and said, okay, we get it, finally we cannot simply say that uh, preferential balloting is acceptable because it's a winner-take-all system. We we're convinced enough, finally, that PR of some sort is needed. If the Liberals did that um, and then we all had put off, you know, on the table and then to put it to the side, but nobody's going to come back on that after the next election. We're going to figure out what system would be in place. The NDP would make our case for MMP within a coalition context. We could not impose it because we would not be a majority government and we wouldn't be minded to impose it anyway. But what we want is everybody to commit to PR before the election, not afterwards. And we think that the, the impetus is there. I think the Liberal Party has mechanisms where they could change their policy before the next election. Mr. Trudeau kicked out a bunch of senators, and it was against his own constitution. He did it before the constitution was changed at the next convention. There are ways to take robust leadership 
uh, without going back and saying we've already decided nothing more can be decided by the Liberal Party. I believe that with, say, Scott's leadership and others, the, the half of the MPs, the Liberal MPs that voted up for my motion, there is a way for the Liberals to finally get off the fence and say we understand preferential balloting on its own cannot work, it is not PR, we do commit to PR, and then we have three parties willing to figure out how to do that afterwards. That would be a monumental pre-electoral commitment. God, uh, I might give you a chance to respond to that, and then Bruce, okay? I'm feeling it was a bit oh, sorry, directed at Scott. Oh yeah, no, no, listen, uh, this is the whole point of having this conversation. I enjoyed what Craig just said. Uh, I'm feverishly writing it down and sending it to Justin as we speak. <laughs> I, I don't mean that facetiously. I'm, I'm just saying that it's, uh, it, it's a valid point. And uh, during this conversation about when do you go ahead, do you commit to it now, do you commit after the election? Look, it's a conversation we're having. As Craig pointed out, we had half of our members to stand up and say that we're all for this one particular system. I'm not saying it's a bad system. I'm just saying that I don't think I feel comfortable enough to say that definitively I'm choosing MMP over STV or any other type of, of system. As a matter of fact, we even have a debate within our party right now with uh, Stéphane Dion, who has been talking about a multi-member districts across this country, multi-member constituencies. Uh, that too we're having, but we're open to having that discussion also. So I appreciate what Craig had to say, and the fact that this has to be a multi-party effort is now being illustrated even through this webinar. Bruce, did you have a comment? I'll start with the positive. Uh, I have the highest regard for uh, Scott Sims. Uh, he's a great MP, and uh, I hope he's elected uh, often. Um, but to be honest, I don't think the Liberals collectively are committed to proportional representation. I think they're going to have to be dragged into it, uh, kicking and screaming. Uh, and I'm very disturbed at the introduction of preferential voting into the suggested myth. To reiterate what I said before, it is not preferential. It favors the larger parties, not the smaller parties. And it's a great system for electing mayors. It's a great system for electing leaders of parties where, uh, where proportionality is not a factor. But I really am hopeful that everyone out there, the 501 people you have out there, are not confused by the smoke and mirrors of preferential voting as a possible alternative to proportional representation. But Bruce, they're not mutually exclusive of each other. Uh, they are in terms. Of I, I, I wouldn't want you. I wouldn't want you. I wouldn't want you to be confused. The fact that we're preferring this over another thing, we adopted preferential balloting a while ago, and we would like to see that go forward. But that doesn't mean that we're not leaving PR on the on the sidelines. I just thought I'd throw that, and I appreciate your comments in the beginning. Okay. Well. Oh, Craig, go ahead. Yeah, this is a very productive line of conversation. So I hope all our listeners will indulge us if me now that I'm coming back. Um, what, what, Bruce, what Bruce said and then what Scott said is extraordinarily important. I want to go back to what I said first and then return. Uh, Scott, what I said was we are fixed and firm on what we think is the best system. Uh, we felt we had to force the debate uh, a, with the, my motion in the House and having half the Liberals vote with us for a specific family of PR, mixed member proportional, was a major breakthrough. Um, but what I'm saying is that I'm not necessarily saying that the Liberal Party has to itself swing to our specific system. If the Liberal Party came around to, we accept proportional representation, finally. Because at the moment, the Liberals have, have, have two policies. One that's preferential balloting is our approach, and that is not proportional. In fact, it can be a, produce worse false majorities than our current system. And the second policy you've layered onto it is let's study after the next election, which of which preference balloting on its own, PR on its own, or a mix of the two. But it's not a pre-electoral commitment to PR. It's still leaving open that we could end up with the Liberals in uh, pushing for PR, after, uh, preferential balloting afterwards. All I'm asking, frankly, is that for the Liberal Party as a whole to commit to PR, um, and they will be faced with an M NDP firmly advocating MMP. Uh, and we have a proposal for how we think that can go forward. Uh, 
and you are right, Scott, that the two can be mixed. If you put in a preferential balloting on the first leg of voting for your local MP, a uh, system that the Jenkins Commission in, um, in the UK suggested was a possibility, you can mix the two. The problem there is the distortions created by pre preferential balloting means that you have to do an awful lot more on the uh, compensatory MP side to make sure you have proportional uh, allocation of seats. It, it's, it's not the best mix, but it's not impossible. So if, if the Liberals were to come forward and say, okay, we like PR and we like preferential balloting and now we want PR with preferential balloting, that would be a very different thing from saying we were going to wait until after the election. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. All right, this one. I think some people, now I'm getting a whole bunch of questions about preferential ballot. <laughs> Can I just uh, take one minute and just kind of summarize this for those who uh, maybe walked into this and went, whoa, what are these guys talking about and what are they arguing about here? <laughs> <laughs> there's again to go back to the presentation that I'm not sure whether it came through on the webcam or not there's two major families of voting systems in the world so proportional representation isn't a system preferential ballot isn't a system okay preferential ballot is like a kind of a ballot it's a tool it can be used in various systems okay so in the proportional family you could make adaptations so that it included a preferential ballot and that's what Craig's saying but if you take a single member riding and just stick a preferential ballot in it, you get another winner-take-all system that doesn't fix 99% of the problems that we have now with first-past-the-post. And that's why the last 10 commissions we had where we put citizens and experts together to look at this, they concluded that that's just not good enough. So when the parties sit down, as Craig said, they need to work out um, compromises around system design. It's not an either-or situation. Um, okay, sorry. This fellow, sorry, laughed. This fellow just said, honestly, I'm about to move, vote with my feet and move to Germany. Do you have anything to say to me before <laughs> I go? <laughs> Don't go! <laughs> We're almost there. Um, well, I mean, in a, in a way, Anita, you know, we have a situation here that we haven't seen in the country probably since 1921. You know, in 1921, we had an election that produced a, a parliament where two-thirds of the MPs claimed that they supported a shift to a proportional voting system. Uh, and then since then, we've seen people come and go, and of course, the major parties often not want to talk about it at all. But here we have a situation where I think the election of a federal green uh, in Elizabeth May has really uh, changed the political agenda. Uh, the NDP, who had sometimes been talking about PR but sometimes not, I think have really uh, gained some backbone on this issue, and they've come forward with a with a with I think the strongest proposal for change that we have ever seen in this country. I mean, not just we like it, but we've got a plan to introduce it. Uh, so, it, I mean, people are watching quite a I think an historic encounter here in terms of the Greens and the NDP and the Liberals. Uh, talking quite frankly about how we can make this change happen. Hmm. Um, somebody says, uh, Anita might want to mention why the Conservatives are not here. Does anybody have a possible comment on that? Craig? Uh, I don't know the answer to that specifically, but I think it is important to, uh, to notice that there are um, very respected leading conservative voices. I, I, I do feel I have to layer that with older progressive conservative voices um, that are staunch supporters of proportional representation. Hugh Siegel is one, and Patrick Boyer, who probably has done more writing around everything to do with our electoral system than any MP who's ever been elected. Um, and he's no longer a progressive conservative MP, but uh, his latest book, by the way, just to put in a plug, is called Our Scandalous Senate. So that's another story. Um, so there are progressive conservatives. There there, are, I think, probably uh, a number of closet uh, proportional representation supporters, even in the current conservative caucus. Um, why there's nobody else here now, I'll leave that to somebody else. 
I can take yeah, that. I, if I, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Well, uh, just from Fair Votes' uh, point of view, we had um, MP visits last year, and with the vote in the House, uh, the recent vote in the House, we understand at this time that Conservatives are not supporting proportional representation. So it's unfortunate if there is a minority situation. I think we may see things change, um, but that's that's where we are right now. Scott, were you going to say something, or Bruce? I, I, I was just going to add that um, once in a while we see snippets of individuality uh, that constitutes somewhat. It's not a free vote, but you have a free voter. Uh, the person I speak of is someone like Michael Chong, who, uh, who I have a lot of respect for, and we've debated with before, as Craig and I have just done. Uh, but, you know, to have someone stand up and, and be fully in favor of some type of PR, electoral reform, uh, to do that might go a long way, although you have yet to receive any of those individuals who would do that on the conservative side of things. And quite frankly, that surprises me. Bruce? Um, Craig's mentioning uh, the scandalous Senate uh, just reminded me. I've heard some people propose an interesting idea, which might or might not be easier than doing it in the House of Commons, and that is to make the uh, Senate not only elected, but elected proportionally, so that at least one of our houses had proportionality and could be a true check and balance on the non-proportional other house similar to Australia. Exactly. So this next question is, how can we make PR a priority issue in the next campaign? Who would like to go first on that? Put up your hand. Kelly, go for it. Yeah, I can uh, talk to that, just what we're doing at Fair Vote. As Anita had mentioned, we're planning on having volunteers almost in all the ridings to really insert this issue into the debate. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily find electoral reform a sexy issue maybe around the election, but I think it's an important issue that a lot of uh, different groups are starting to realize that to move their campaigns forward, proportional representation is an absolute that we have to. It levels the playing field and it, it will allow us to move a lot of campaigns forward, I think. So we have a big plan to do that. Uh, we are working with allies, getting them to talk about proportional representation. Um, and as you can see, the parties are talking about it as well. So I think we just continue to keep moving this, this issue forward and uh, grow the choir, as we like to say at Fair Vote. Anyone else want to answer that? Bruce. I'm just going to reiterate what I said earlier. If Fair Vote Canada really uh, wants to go beyond uh, a peripheral education to uh, a small group of uh, people, um, I think let's take off the gloves and support any and all parties that are truly committed to uh, proportional representation and go even further and say Party X and Party Y do not seem to be in favor of proportional rep representation or truly committed to it. And uh, we suggest that you do not vote for those parties. Kelly? <clears throat> yeah, sorry, just what Bruce said, if I can add to that. We will have uh, on our website a report card. We are going to be looking at every single writing, every single candidate. We're going out to them with questions on where they stand, and we'll be able to gauge their commitment to proportional representation, and we will be um, showcasing or recommending that voters do vote for candidates that will support PR. We need 170 votes after the next election, and that's what we're going for. Yeah. Well, Dennis first, I think. Dennis, did you have something to say? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good for the moment. Okay, Craig? Yeah, um, only I, 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 what Kelly just said is important. Um, but it has to be sort of given a bit of a dose of realism as well that Bruce brought into the picture, which is 
um, you will have a, a, a large-ish number of candidates um, I'm going to just say, from the Liberals who will say I'm in favor of PR. And in fact, uh, 16 stood up or 15 stood up in the House and said exactly that. And then you have Scott, who I, I, I know is, is, is very sympathetic at minimum to PR, but had a good reason for not voting for my motion. We have to understand that individuals in our system, we're still in our system, uh, are subject to whatever particular form of party this is when their party uh, operates. And um, uh, it, it's party discipline in my party. Uh, there's certainly party discipline in the Liberal Party, and we're seeing a lot of evidence of that in, in recent times. And so th there has to be some harder questions than just are you f in favor. I think there has to be a, a, a reference to, to say this candidate has said yes, his or her party is not supporting. And I think there needs to be this level of extra pressure on the party to make sure that if, if otherwise my efforts to push the entire Liberal Party to change its views uh, clearly before the next election um, won't get as much traction because they will understand that individual candidates can help themselves by committing even though the overall party is uh, pulling their punches. Scott, I, because you're not on a webcam, I can't see your little box light up. When you have something to say, just jump in, okay? Okay. Um, I think one of the, the major um, influences for many of us, including the, the ones who did stand up to that motion and ones who did not, were the third-party qualifiers, as it were, yourselves, Fairville, BC, Lead Now, uh, and these organizations. More of these organizations that are at the grassroots uh, through colleges, through campuses, uh, through seniors groups, uh, if if they get their communications out to say, you sh here's what PR looks like, here's what um, uh, a new type of voting system would look like, show them what the ballot looks like. Um, if you want to, you know, make the tick for the individual as well as the party. I think these third-party qualifiers beyond the party system uh, can play a key role to bringing the education level up uh, to way beyond just us who are speaking here tonight on this webinar. And Fairville Canada, by the way, did I leave them out? <laughs> um, so this person, I'm just going to repeat this. I feel like we already answered this, but this, but maybe we didn't since this person seems to not think so. So it says, I'm still waiting for an answer to my question. Shouldn't all parties be committed to forming committees that will enact a new proportional system uh, in the 2019 election? And at this time, quit focusing on one particular system. And this actually also relates to a question I got in my inbox, a concern that basically focusing on a particular system confuses voters and what we should be doing is making a case against first past the post. <clears throat> Are there any comments on that? <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with Bruce this time. Well, um, this is to Craig, really. Uh, Craig, um, I, I certainly... Uh, can live with mixed member proportional. I would never vote against mixed member proportional. Um, I'm sometimes intrigued by the possibilities of some forms of, of single transferable vote, but um, I could very handily live with mixed member proportional. So I'm ready to, I, I voted for your motion, as you know, but I, I really do think that when we take people from the status quo and the devil they know and the new devil they don't understand that introducing an extra element of confusion will prevent it. So I really hope that um, the first uh, decision is do we get rid of the system we have now and get some kind of proportional system and then there are many ways whether it's second referendum or it's the kind of cooperation you've talked about but we have to have a clear mandate from the Canadian, the majority of the Canadian public to actually change systems before we try to figure out the best one. Uh, 
I think Craig was first. Dennis, no, Dennis, go ahead first. Well, I just wanted to say that um, you know I'm hearing a lot of concern about the voters, rightly so, in a democracy. I'm hearing a lot of concern about them being confused. Um, but you know, the research that we do in political science suggests that the public are not terribly well informed. Uh, even if they like things, they're not terribly well informed about them. When we ask them factual questions about how their institutions work, uh, very few can answer them. Uh, you know, most Canadians think that when you say we have a majority government, they think it means they have a majority of the votes. Um, that, that's that been repeated in, in, in num numerous studies. Um, so often the public's reaction is based on the party's reactions. If the parties that the public support support the changes, then the public tend to support them as well. And by the same token, when parties don't like something, they send a message through their supporters that they don't like it. And so then a lot of the public opposition is not, I don't want to say orchestrated by the parties, but the parties aren't playing a role in terms of directing the public attention in one direction or another. So I'd just like to say, maybe contrary to some of the discussion we've heard tonight, that if the parties are solidly behind this idea of proportional representation, then their supporters will probably go with them. If, I think the Greens are prepared to take any proportional they can get. I think that there's a lot of New Democrats are, are prepared to take their party's leadership on having a different kind of share of power at the federal level. And I, I certainly think that uh, there are many liberals uh, who would respond positively to like, this is why we think this is a good thing. Uh, so I think, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse. Uh, I think the role the parties play in leading this discussion will be absolutely crucial to how Canadians respond to it. And I'll just be brief. Um, I certainly see the um, the legitimacy of the concern, um, but uh, the judgment call that we made was that uh, that not only has there been this uh, whole series of very deep and in profound, uh, profound uh, uh, studies uh, from the Law Commission of Canada to these different assemblies, etc. Uh, but uh, the NDP them ourselves in the early 2000s uh, carried on, carried out what was basically an internal commission that was almost just ahead of a lot of these other commissions. And we came to the same conclusion as all these different commissions and assemblies, except one, came to on our own steam. And so it's a matter of almost uh, having done the legwork, having done the hard work, and having figured it out that this is the best system for Canada, um, I feel duty bound to present that and say that while saying that within mixed member proportional, there are about 12 to 15 institutional design choices that need to be made to make sure it fits as best as possible uh, the Canadian situation. What are the threshold cutoffs for uh, for how many votes you have to get in order to get seats on the proportional side, that's, that's those kinds of questions. The other reason is frankly political, which is we feel like one party needs to show seriousness of purpose and we do not feel that the public would see any party as serious unless it is thought through which system it actually wants. Uh, if we came forward and started saying PR, 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 let's talk about what form of PR, I honestly think people would say it's kind of same old, same old. And we actually have thought it through. We feel the duty to actually say which one we want. That said, frankly, the Liberals are in, the, in, in a weird sort of driver's seat. It's the back driver's seat if one exists. But if the Liberals were to change the conversation by committing to PR without having done that legwork we have done and uh, and knowing which specific system, then the conversation would change. And we might be back to Bruce's insights about how we go about it. At the moment, however, we want people to uh, come to our view that this is the right system. Simple as that. Kelly? Thanks, Anita. Um, when we were talking about our communications around this campaign, we started off with the system is broken. We needed everybody to understand that first past the post doesn't work for the majority of Canadians. And I think we're past that stage. I think pretty much everybody gets it. And then we decided that we're going to move on after the experience with the Ontario referendum where people turned around and, and said they didn't understand 
what was being asked of them. I think it's Fairvote's job to start to fill in some of those holes. And when you look at what's happening in the newspapers, uh, a lot of what we're talking about is starting to be absorbed and put out there through the media. So I think we do have to talk about it. I think we have to talk about all the systems. Um, we are have just developed three new videos that we'll have on our website with uh, Dex Pilo as our narrator. They turned out fantastic. And that we'll look at a couple of the, uh, or three of the systems. Um, so we're just going to continue to expand this. So when it does come back around and we are going to be voting on this or if we're going to have a citizens assembly or whatever is going to happen, we are going to be well informed and we're going to have the information there at our, our fingertips so that we can move this forward and make sure that this happens. All right, we're in the last couple minutes of our webinar. I actually okay. had a question that I was wondering if I could ask the MPs here because I've heard different opinions. Um, when the NDP put their motion forth on December 3rd, it was a free vote. Uh, will the next vote, the one that is really going to bring PR or not, will it be a free vote? What do you think? I guess that one's for me, right? <laughs> sure, and Craig and Bruce. Okay, I just thought I'd put my hand up because we were the the proverbial divided caucus on the whole issue. <laughs> um, yeah, I I, uh, I didn't get a chance to answer the last question, so I just want to back up for just briefly. Um, I appreciate Craig's point. Actually, through this conversation we're having here, I now have a better understanding of where uh, Craig's motion was coming from. And there you go. And that's the whole point of doing this. So thank you. Um, free votes, yes. It was... Um, without giving away too many caucus confidences, it was Justin who came to us and said, folks, I need you to vote freely on this issue in a big way. Uh, I want you to be engaged in debate, but vote freely uh, as to how we're going about doing this. We are now in the process of writing the language for the platform to go forward. What we have right now is the party resolution overwhelmingly accepted. So in a way, from, from Dennis's point, it's it's almost like I hope you know the party will drag the upper echelons of the liberal uh, us the MPs in, they'll drag us into a situation where um, that may be favorable to all of us and I've had a great discussion here and I think that by having more of these free votes in the future it will continue so that way by 2019 we'll have true electoral reform. I guess all I would say, yeah, all I would say is that um, uh, uh, this is one of the areas where there wouldn't really need to be a free vote because there, frankly, is no strong dissensus in our party. Uh, I will be honest. I think I maybe know two of my 95 MPs, uh, colleague MPs, who kind of have an old school view of this and and maybe aren't all that keen on PR. And that's it. Um, mm -hmm. If, if for their sake uh, we could say vote for the current system, the chances are they would vote with us because there's this collegial view about how one chooses one's own free vote. So I think it's a little bit of a, yeah, sh sure. I mean, I'd be happy to say uh, when the time comes it would be a free vote. What I would say is that in good faith, uh, if what came before the House of Commons uh, turned out not to be the mixed member proportional as we've been describing it. Let's just say it had something creative at the front end that we never thought of, you know, electing two members to each local riding in order to uh, deal with some problem people see that could be better fixed that way. Um, my strong sense is at that point there might be free vote, but my own personal view is that anything that comes out of a strong citizen and expert consultation that is proportional representation will deserve uh, um, every MP's vote. So um, at that point in time, if the system changed from what is our current strong policy position, my guess is it would be presented as a free vote, but you'd almost certainly be getting very strong recommendations from me as critic if I um, continued in this role or some analog or from the leader saying, yeah, it's a free vote, but uh, we really do recommend you vote for this. 
All right, I think that's a really good place to wrap up. Um, I let it go over a little bit longer because we were a bit late starting with our technical difficulties. So just to um, reiterate, there's you know a few hundred of us on the line. We will be editing this, improving it, <laughs> editing out the technical difficulties and making this available at some point on YouTube. It's been a really great discussion. Um, I wanted to give the floor over to Kelly for uh, two or three minutes just to wrap up our webinar. Thanks. And thanks, Anita, for your great uh, presentation. And I also want to thank Scott and Craig and Bruce and Dennis for participating in this. We really appreciate you making the time for this and everybody else coming out. And I just wanted to tell everybody a little bit about Fair Vote Canada. We're a not-for-profit. Uh, we're not a charity because of our political work. Uh, so we do, cannot get charity status, so we don't get our funding from any organizations. We get our funding from supporters. So if you agree with the work that we're doing and you want to make all votes count, then I'm asking you to go over to our website and help us with our work and to make a donation and help us push this campaign forward. And uh, that's all I would like to say, and thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Craig, Bruce, Dennis, Kelly, and Scott. And I hope this isn't the last conversation. Good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you. Thank you for your work. All right, thank, thank you. you.